now it's being recorded. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> yeah, so you guys are gonna be choosing your components because that's gonna be, uh, that's just for the purpose of a lot easier communication between us and you guys with respect to the board design. So we don't have to like double check package sizes and everything. So you know that the parts are gonna fit on your final PCB. And so, yeah, that's just a quick announcement. And so for today, we're gonna to be going over uh, the beginning of the schematic lecture. And we're gonna just go over four of the eight primary topics today. So next slide. Yeah. So um, last lecture, we went over motor drivers and we're on top of motor drivers today, we're gonna to be going over the uh, battery, voltage divider circuit, voltage regulator and decoupling caps. And then next lecture in, I believe, two weeks, we'll be going over the remainder of the components on the quad. So that would be the microcontroller, the sensors, the radio module, and the clock circuit. And so as a recap, we'll just go over the motor drivers first. And um, you'll recall that we've been using, we're going to be using low side drivers with an NMOS transistor on our quad. And we'll be using uh, PWM capable pins from our MCU in order to transmit the necessary signals. And also remember that the gate of the NMOS is modeled as a cap. So we need a pull down resistor between the gate and ground. And does anyone want to answer the question just to jog our memory why we choose to use a low side driver as opposed to a high side? It was a checkoff question. No. Okay. Well. Okay. So. so when the, oh, no. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah. If it uh no, then it, it gets turned. If if like the thing stops sending like code, if we stop like running the code, then the motors will like turn on, and we, we don't want that. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons. And additionally, um, another reason. Oh, sorry. What was that? Also, I think it's more expensive. Uh, you would require more components if you use the high side. So we need an inverted level shifter. And uh, with our application, space is a really like valuable, space on our PCB is a really valuable commodity. <clears throat> yeah, so that's just review for motor drivers. And so this might look like a lot of content on this page, but it's just uh, like the key specifications for your transistor that you have to watch out for when you're selecting your components. So first there's the threshold voltage and that's the voltage that's uh, required at the gate of the MOSFET in order for the MOSFET to essentially begin like conducting current in like a linear fashion. So the more voltage, uh, the more current will pass from source to drain. And next is the on resistance, which is the resistance between the, uh, the source and drain of the MOSFET within its, while it's within the linear region of operation. And we want that to be as low as possible because it's essentially a parasitic that could affect the performance of our circuit. And next we also have the max rec max maximum recommended operating voltage and the current of the MOSFET itself. And that's just to make sure that the motor driver, uh, you just have to make sure that the motor driver while it's running doesn't exceed these values or else you could risk damaging the transistor. And then we have uh, the maximum operating temperature, which is also relatively self-explanatory. It's just the max temp at which the MOSFET can still operate normally. And thermal resistance is the temperature difference between the ambient and maximum operating temperature over the dissipated power and a little formula right there. And in our application, lower is better because we want our MOSFET to stay cool. And these last two, uh, parameters, the operating temperature and the thermal resistance, they're not too important to worry about in our application, simply just because um, it, everything's going to be, it, it's not like contained within a, uh, it's not contained within an enclosure. So heat isn't something we have to worry about too much. And then- I have a quick uh, about the threshold voltage. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there's- there's no instance where we're actually going to be requiring the whole linear thing, right? We, we're just sending like on and off signals, so it's going to work the same value every time, and we don't have to worry about the linear aspect of it, just whether it's on 
that was sort of yeah good. yeah so the threshold voltage is just the range at which uh so essentially as long as the 3.3 volts that the uh, mc outputs is within the threshold range that the uh that as long as it's within the linear region of operation you're it, it'll work all right thanks Uh, and next, we're going to be going over decoupling capacitors. And decoupling caps are placed between ground and uh, any voltage source to suppress noise when power is supplied. And they act pretty similarly to like an uninterruptible power supply for an IC. So it's kind of like the redundant power supplies you might see in like some uh, server applications. And uh, if the power, if the voltage of the supplied power suddenly drops, Temporarily, it could be like whenever we turn on a motor or have uh, the or whenever we're sending a signal, a decoupling capacitor can briefly supply power to compensate for that in order to prevent that voltage drop. And unlike ideal capacitors, the capacitors we're using are in the real world, and they do have some form of innate inductance and resistance. And that's why you usually see decoupling capacitors in sets of twos and threes. And they're also usually used in parallel. So adding capacitors in parallel, they increase the stuff we want, which is capacitance, and decrease the stuff we don't want, which is inductance and resistance in our application, which is filtering out noise. And uh, these capacitors, they act pretty similarly to a band stop filter with regards to the frequencies of noise that they allow to pass. And I'll show you that on the next slide. So smaller capacitances are effective at filtering out high frequency noise due to their low inductance. So and larger capacitances are effective for low frequency noise because they have large reserves of charge available. And we use a small and large capacitor together in order to form a filter. So we filter out high using small capacitors and then filter out low using large capacitors. And uh, luckily for you guys, you guys won't have to like guess and check values and stuff. We'll be giving you the necessary capacitance values to use in your circuits. Eric, you're muted. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> unmute to unmute button. Uh, yeah, so for for our um our uh for our board, we're going to have to have a <laughs> wait one second one second. <laughs> Sorry. Um. So for the uh battery, uh, our drone will be using up a lot of battery. Uh, wait. <laughs> okay. Sorry, <laughs> sorry guys. Uh, yeah, for our drones, we'll be using a lot, a lot of battery. Um, today I was actually working with it, and I I kind of used up a battery already. So it uses a lot. As we uh, have talked about, the motors will draw a lot of current. Um, so one thing that we want to make sure we do is uh, uh, make sure that when we can uh, measure the uh, the the voltage our battery has as our quadcopter is working. So. Um, the battery we'll be using is a voltage of 3.7 volts. Um, however, the voltage range for QBIDs analog has to be between 0 and 3.3. .3. Um, so what, in order for us to uh, measure the voltage across the battery instead of directly measuring across it, um, our input has to be below 3.3. .3, so we're going to use a voltage divider um, and read V out as shown on the right. Um, and then, yeah, so if the, that way, so if the battery drops below, we can cut off the power for our motors because Potentially, what might happen is that um, our uh, like digital logic in our microcontroller becomes inconsistent and might turn our motors on really fast, which happened today to me. Um, so, which because I didn't implement this, uh, so we want to make sure that we have this in our circuit. Um, well, one thing though is that uh, when you have a voltage divider, when you read uh, across, uh, if you put a load at your V out, your V out at that given node won't always won't end up being the same right because you end up having a parallel resistance in the bottom and your resistance changes so because of that um if when we read through the mcu the mcu has an internal resistance at the pin um generally it's okay because the resistance of the input pins will be really high and will not affect the circuit 
um, because it won't draw a lot of current to the to the pin. Oh shoot. Um, so in a, a circuit, we would typically choose a large distances R1 and R2 so that um, less current is drawn and thus less power is used uh, so that we can have more power uh, current for the rest of the circuit. Um, but then when we start increasing it too much, let's suppose that R2 and uh, starts to approach RMCU. Uh, can anyone tell me what might happen? So right now, let's say R1 and R2 are equal. And our goal is for battery to be at 3.7, which means that the voltage divider V out would be in the middle, which is one point. Whoa, <laughs> uh, 1.85. Um, and then if we had, but if we had R1 and R2 really large, what might happen? Will we still have 1.85 at the V out? Anybody? I didn't get, what were you saying about 1.85? What is that? Right, so our, our battery voltage will be 3.7, right? If we look at the previous slide, our V in would be 3.7, and we have an R1 and R2. Um, and let's say those are equal. So it's like a, a, just a half a voltage divider, but uh, by half. Then our V out here would be 1.85, because it's half 3.5, right? Um, however, this is ideal. So if we could have a perfect uh, uh, voltage input uh, a, a voltmeter, a, per, a perfect voltmeter. But in the real world, there is some resistance right here. So yeah, so if we start increasing R1 and R2 too much, what might happen? And suppose R2 is equal to RMCU. Uh, I think you'll go below 1.85 because uh, the second no, because the RMCU is also drawing current, so it's going to lower the voltage. Yep, that's correct. Um, if you uh, you would also think about it as the bottom two, R two and R MCU are in parallel. Um, if R two is equal to R MCU, then uh, then the resistance in the bottom half will have. So you end up having it will be like a third of that instead of one half of that. So that's why you want to design it so that your, your R1 and R2 are smaller than RMCU by a significant amount, but also not too large so you don't draw too much power. Uh, right, so that's exactly what we just talked about. So yeah, um, using resistors around 10K will be fine. We'll just give you that value. Um, just like we said last time, that's about a tenth of the magnitude of a input pin. So that's, that'll be fine. Um, right, voltage regulators. So since our MCU operates at 3.3 volts and we're using a 3.7 volt battery to power our, our quad, then we need to have a device that's able to drop our voltage to 3.3. Um, and if you think of ways that you could do this, one is, for example, um, doing the voltage by everything we just talked about. But since we're going to be drawing a lot of current, that will cause the loading effect and not always output 3.3 volts. So what a voltage regulator does is it's a component that it uh, can uh, keep the output at a certain voltage that it's specified to do um, without, uh, regardless of the uh, current that's going through it. So there are two main types of voltage regulators, linear and switching voltage regulators. Uh, linear voltage regulators operate by, um, compa they compare the output to a voltage and then, uh, adjust the output again based on the error. So it's kind of like a feedback loop. Um, the output isn't very noisy, so it's very good uh, in giving uh, a very accurate signal. Um, the input voltage must be a, a minimum level above the output. So you can't output a voltage with this that is higher than um, what your input is, which is 3.7 from your power supply. Um, however, the thing about a lin uh, how linear voltage regulators work is that a lot of it's resistive. So a lot of excess power is converted to heat, um, and that's how the voltage is dropped down. So it's just considered very inefficient, especially when we have high power applications like our, our drone. Um, on the other hand, there are switching voltage regulators. 
Um, and this is what we're going to be using in our quad. So it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but basically what happens is you uh, have an inductor that charges this capacitor. Um, and then when you uh, with the dial to continue the circuit as you switch it on and off. And as you switch it on and off, you can kind of charge a capacitor and then discharge it, which will uh, into a load, which will allow you to have a higher or lower uh, voltage, depending on how the circuit is designed. So um, specifically, we're going to be using buck boost. Uh, this is the concept of a, a charge pump, I believe. Um, but they, they all work in a similar fashion. But there's specific reasons why we want to use a buck boost voltage regulator. So when you guys are searching for parts, try to search for that. Um, they're definitely more efficient than linear voltage regulators because um, excess power is con converted to a magnetic electric fields. Um, and if you've learned about electrodynamics, uh, you know that uh, uh, energy stored uh, uh, across an inductor and a capacitor is not dissipated, it's just stored. What, uh, because magnetic and electric uh, fields uh, will store the energy um, and then it'll eventually go back into the circuit. So it'll, it won't dissipate the power nearly as much. Right, so this is specific, more important to us uh, for when you're choosing your voltage regulator. You definitely want to consider a lot of the things that we talked about with the MOSFETs. So it's just the standard operating voltage, current, thermal resistance, and the maximum operating temperature. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this word. <laughs> Aaron? <laughs> it's quiescent. Quiescent current. Oof. This is the current drawn by the regulator, um, even when there's no output voltage. Um, this is, uh, the reason for this isn't too important, but uh, generally you want to keep it as small as possible to minimize your energy loss. Um, then there's the noise characteristics. You want to try to minimize the noise, as we talked about, for example, it's always a pay, like a, uh, a give or take. Um, your uh, linear voltage regulators will have very little noise. Switching voltage regulators sometimes will have a lot more noise. And then uh, if you had to switch in a larger range, it would also be larger noise typically. So you want to choose something that's like just right for our circuit. And then we're going to give you this parameter. You could find it yourself, but we're just going to give it to you. Um, but you must be able to provide at least 100 milliamps or more uh, at a reasonable noise level to ensure that components will receive enough current. Um, and keep this in mind, because if you remember doing your lab, um, your, your motors might draw a lot of current and that also might induce a lot of noise. Um, so the regulators will not directly power your motor. And this is important when you're designing a your your circuit. Remember our, our uh, motors will be directly powered from our battery, but our voltage regulator will power our microcontroller, which will control the, the motor. So just keep remember that. Cool, that's all the, the kind of technical modular topics for now. Um, is there any questions about those? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I got confused in the beginning. Why why are we trying to turn off the motor below a certain voltage in the first place? Wait, sorry, uh, could you explain again? Let's say it again. So the voltage regulator is defined if it's below like 3.3 or whatever, and then turn off the motor if it's below that, right? The voltage or, regulator? So or, are you saying the voltage regulator? Or, yeah, what was the whole purpose of the entire system? I don't right. how it like, works, but why are we using it? Yeah, so voltage regulators, you can think of almost as like a, a power supply. Um, it takes a input source, like our battery, but our MCU has to operate exactly at 3. Point, well, uh, very close to 3.3 .3 volts. So our input power into our MCU isn't arbitrary. We have to use 3.3 .3 volts, but we don't have a 3.3 .3 volt battery for it because that the battery is geared towards the motor. Um, our, so our motors require a higher voltage than the, uh, than the MC. The MC operates at like 3.3 .3 volts and our motors operate anywhere between 3.3 .3 and five volts. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. Uh, and, and the thing before that, the, the thing, well, is there something before, am I getting really confused? Yeah. Yeah. Voltage divider? Yeah. The voltage divider, um, is this what you're asking? Yeah, about? yeah, this was the whole thing where we were trying to, yeah. if, if the voltage went below, we were trying to stop the motors. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Just when your battery right. Why were we doing that? Um, one reason is that your control, 
you might have digital error when your battery starts running low. Um, the main reason though is that you're, you'll notice when you actually start coding the quad is that um, you know how we use PWM for the motors, right? Yeah. Um, in order for it to actually fly, it'll be around like around like seven, uh, eight, 80, 80 ish percent duty cycle. So when you're varying the speed in order to control it, um, and so like some turn, one side turns on higher, one, time, one side turns on lower, then um, it'll be like ranging from like 100 to 60. And what, what would happen is if your um, uh, battery starts getting too low, it can't actually output enough uh, torque for the aircopter to reorient itself to actually turn the aircopter. So it'll start flying and like off to somewhere else if you, it's not with what you designed it to be. Yeah, so typically yeah. if it goes below what um, it should like a certain level, you should turn it off instead. Because if, if it starts like flying and going haywire, it'll crash and you can't like manually go and unplug it, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and um, my last question is, uh, we were talking about choosing an uh, never mind. I just understood it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Cool, cool. Is there any other questions? Speak now or well, we'll always be there for you to ask questions, but if you have a question, other people are probably thinking it too. Okay, if not, I'll keep going. So um, this is kind of a precursor to where assignment is starting to go towards now. Um, we're going to be designing our schematics in a software called EagleCAD. Um, you might be wondering like, oh, we already did like the breadboarding with the motor. Why would we have to like draw these schematics that you know kind of already exist um, or that we might already have versions of? Uh, the, the schematics that you're going to draw in EagleCAD are not just purely visual. They're not for you to see what the connections are like. It's actually telling the computer what parts are um, and how they should be connected. Later on, we're going to be converting the schematic design into a board design. And this is kind of the skeleton of what our board design will look like. Um, so these parts, for example, let's say this is some random integrated circuit. If you were to convert to a board, it'll give you the footprint for where you would put the actual component on. And it would also tell you, okay, you need to connect these things. So that's why when you start moving things around, um, it'll keep telling you, it'll still have lines saying you need to connect these things. Um, so this is, uh, so your schematics will have to be robust. They have to connect to the right things. It's not purely visual. Um, and it all is, is just a software to do that. Um, uh, we're gonna have a, uh, a, we have a tutorial written out for you guys how to do this. There's also a lot of online ones that we're gonna link to you guys to follow because um, uh, it's definitely, uh, if you're new to it, it's just a new skill, a new tool. So it, no, there's no way it'll come intuitively. What I do suggest, of course, I've said this a lot in the first lecture, there's going to be a, uh, a Eagle workshop in uh, uh, next Monday by our IEEE's workshop group. So definitely go to that if you're new to it. And or else if you miss it, then there's not too much we can do about it. We'll just, you'll probably just struggle a lot more if you don't go to it. So yeah, this week's lab, our first checkpoint will be due on next Friday. So you'll have about two weeks to do it. Um, you're gonna implement on Eagle the following things. So first is motor drivers. You've learned how to do this already. Um, you can use the same package as, or the same components that you chose before. Um, I know that some of you guys had like some different ideas, like some different packages. Um, if you want to change it, it's fine. Just run it by us when you actually do it. Uh, and then you have to implement a voltage regulator, which will be your power supply to your MCU. Um, then there's your power supply, which is your battery um, with decoupling capacitors, uh, a voltage divider. Um, and you know how we're trying to measure V out. We're not implementing the MCU yet because there's a lot of data sheet reading that um, we want to uh, do later for you guys. Um, just assume that the signals that are going to connect to the MCU, like the V out, will eventually be connected. So you can just leave it as like a line or a, like a wire. It's fine. And you have to do the bomb for all of this. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Any questions about those? 
all the information will be on the lab. So this is kind of a high level overview of it. Cool. Announcements. I just want to ask the voltage divider. Is that like, um, not, not the voltage divider, the, uh, the voltage regulator. Is that yeah. a part where we're going to have to like do the insides or is that like just a IC or something like pre-designed for us? Wait, wait, sorry, it's waiting. Into a circuit or whatever. I can't really hear. Oh, there. Um, hold on. Is this better? I think you're cutting. Um, yeah. Okay. You need to type it in the chat. It's kind of quiet. Is this, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, the voltage regulator, is that like a pre-made part that we can just like plop in the circuit or is, is it like more complicated to make sure we have Yeah, it, so it's right? going to be like a module that you can order. It'll um, on the data sheet, it'll tell you things that needs to be connected to it, but it's normally like an eight pin like module and then, yeah, you don't have to like make it yourself or anything. That's, yeah. Cool, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, any other questions? Will the PCB lab be recorded? PCB lab? Like the Eagle or not lab? The, the yeah, I think they will, they okay. are. Okay, cool. The workshops are recorded. Mm. All right. going right announcements there's going to be a lot this whole page everything on here is pretty much on the schedule on the website there is a section specifically for a schedule we haven't changed anything so everything's still the same because you guys have been good with the, the the due dates and stuff so far um yeah so our next uh lecture will be two weeks from now um on tuesday same time same link uh we'll remind you on the day of again but try to keep that time blocked out. Um, this, I definitely suggest going to this, that lecture. It'll be very in-depth on how you're going to connect everything else when you're designing the schematic. Uh, the third checkpoint is due tomorrow for the last lab. If For those who haven't finished, if you finished, it's all good. Um, there's just a few who haven't. Uh, um, right, so the checkpoint one for this lab is due next Friday, which I mentioned. Um, and then once again, for those who are new to schematic design and part selection, um, oh wait, this is a different thing that I was going to mention. Um, this, uh, I de definitely recommend when you guys work this time, uh, th throughout this week and next week, um, try to meet with your team during our lab hours if possible, and that way you guys can hop in and out, um, and we can try our best to help. Um, some of you guys still haven't sent your deposits yet. I will hunt you down because I have to, but I also have a lot of work, so don't make me do it. Just, just send, the, <laughs> send the deposits in. Okay, events, bolded, Eagle Workshop next Monday. Please go to that one if you're new to it. it it's gonna help so much. Um, these are just some other IEEE events. Um, if you're looking for those who are like third years, maybe second years looking for recruiting, there's a soft, uh, Qualcomm talk, uh, what day is it? Two days from now, um, and then Oh, that's, a, that's supposed to say party. <laughs> There's a Halloween party uh, with, <laughs> with USC uh, on Friday. Uh, so definitely come out to that. All the, I think all the details should be on the IEEE uh, Facebook page in terms of the time and the links and stuff. So if you guys want, are interested, go check those out. But yes, that is all everybody. That is all for today.